Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord lay upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sins of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our, with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Hidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priest and the Pharisees and went there with landers, torches and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen, went out and said to them, whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck 
the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Melchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. And the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus, but Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the accountants of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the girls were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple gods standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone, in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? 
your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me what have you done jesus answered my kingdom does not belong to this world if my kingdom did belong to this world my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the jews but as it is my kingdom is not here so pilate said to him then you are a king jesus answered you say i am a king for this i was born and for this i came into the world to testify to the truth every one who belongs to the truth listen to my voice pilate said to him what is truth when he had said this he again went out to the jews and said to them i find no guilt in him but you how a custom that i release one prisoner to you at passover do you want me to release to you the king of the jews they cried out again not this one but parabas now parabas was a revolutionary then pilate took jesus and had him scourged and the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak and they came to him and said hail king of the jews and they struck him repeatedly once more pilate went out and said to them look i am bringing him out to you so that you may know that i find no guilt in him so jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak and he said to them behold the man when the chief priest and the guards saw him they cried out crucify him crucify him pilate said to them take him yourselves and crucify him i find no guilt in him the jews answered we have a law and according to that law we ought to die because he made himself the son of god now the when pilate heard this statement he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to jesus where are you from jesus did not answer him so pilate said to him do you not speak to me do you not know that i have power to release you and i i have power to crucify you jesus answered him you would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above for this reason the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin consequently pilate tried to release him but the jews cried out if you release him you are not a friend of caesar everyone who makes himself a king opposes caesar when pilate heard these words he brought jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called stone pavement in hebrew kabata it was preparation day for passover and it was about noon and he said to the jews behold your king they cried out take pilate said to them shall i crucify your king the chief priest answered then he handed him over to them to be crucified so they took jesus and carrying the cross himself he went out to what is called the place of the skull in hebrew kolgotha there they crucified him and with him two others one on either side with jesus in the middle pilot also had an inscription written and put on the cross it read jesus the nazarene the king of the jews 
Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, Latin and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a springe of hyssop and put it up into his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. For the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other, one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they come, came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lungs into his side. Immediately, blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of mirra and loaves weighing about 100 pounds. 
they took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial clothes along with the species according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new doom in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the doom was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, before I begin my homely, let us pray for the departed souls, the souls have left from this world to God because of this coronavirus, the people who have lost their lives they may rest in peace. I would like to put a question to you. How many of you, like, crucified Jesus? And how many of you, like, resurrected Jesus? Because whenever we enter into the church, we are able to look at the crucified Jesus. In all the churches and even in the homes, always we are able to see the crucified Lord. When I was a seminarian, I had a thought about it. Is the crucified Lord greater than the resurrected Lord? Is crucified Lord is much given importance than the resurrected Lord? Is our church giving so much importance to crucified Lord than resurrected Lord? So a lot of questions came, to, came into my mind because it's better to have the resurrected Lord at the altar than the crucified Lord because whenever I saw, whenever I look at the crucified Lord, the suffering, the passion, the death come into my mind. So why can't the church allow to have resurrected Lord at the altar than keeping the crucified Lord? But I got your answer that without death, there is no life. Without this cross, there is no salvation. Now we all know that there is one, one country, the name called Lithuania. The country name is Lithuania. It is one of the European countries. This country is near Sweden and Den Denmark. So in the country called Lithuania, there is a one city called Sule. So in the Sule, the city, it is an industrial city, the Sule. The popular of this city, there is a hill. There's a beautiful hill which is very popular. The hill name, the fascinating hill name was Hill of Crosses. You can very well, you can go to Google and search. When you type Lithuania itself, the Hill of Crosses will come. The history of this Hill of Crosses, it's near 2006 when they counted the uh, numbers of crosses, there were more than 100,000 crosses were in that hill. So what would be the, the background of this hill? Actually, that hill where it, where it is, that city, Sule, 
It was founded in 12th century, in 1236, in the year of 1236. So what was the background, how the hundred thousands of crosses were there, then when we looked at the background of the, the uh, hill, there are so many people who take pilgrims to that hill and go and submit their problems as a symbol of their problems, as the symbol of their difficulties, they keep one cross there. Because that city had been so many, it was invaded by so many people, so many nations. So the people, the people who were all suffering, once upon a time, the people who suffered a lot, they went into the hill as pilgrims and they kept the cross and prayed. So that's why the cross was at least minimum hundred thousands of crosses. Still it is in there. You can very well search the hill of crosses. The special way these crosses especially is the great symbol of willingness to accept trials and trust in God. The people who were all suffering because of the invading other countries, they, they were the people who were all uh, slaves, they kept the cross. It is the willingness to accept the trials and trust in God. And also this hill of crosses is the great symbol of the hope and the expectation that prayers are always answered. It is their, their hope and expectation that one day their prayers will be heard and they believe that their prayers are answered. And also the hill of the cross is the great symbol of the readiness to face the adversity knowing that the Lord takes care of them. The really, and also in the year of 1992, Pope John Paul II had a visit. He had visited the Hill of Crosses and he remarked that the Hill of Crosses testifies to the nations of Europe and the whole world the faith of the people of this land. So today, on Good Friday, we are all looking at the uh, crucified Lord. We are all focusing upon the cross. So we are looking at the cross. We know that the cross is our faith. The cross is the symbol of our faith. And also the crucified Lord reminds the inevitability of the cross in the life of the Christian. The need to be persons who are responsive to the, this crucifying challenge of Christianity. The cross as a symbol of Christianity, really it is the hope to the people. Normally the beginning the cross was not popular. The cross became popular in the second century, especially in the, when the Constantine was as an emperor. At that time he encouraged everyone and finally, at that time only, the importance given to the cross and it was established in the re religion of Christianity. Christianity sometimes it's like strange, it's really strange. Because when we compare our Christian Christianity, when, our, when we compare our religion with the other ways of life, it's completely, totally different. Whereas when, while the other ways of life propose actualizing oneself and finding salvation through one's own abilities, but Christianity propose discovering the mystery of God with his grace and gaining salvation with him alone and through Jesus alone. While the other ways of life propose 
casting away all pains and difficulties and living a prosperous life christianity proposes accepting sufferings and trials and detaching oneself from vain riches while the other ways of life propose liberal liberality and openness in identifying the modern trend of the modern world christianity propose swimming against this wrong trend and enjoying the true love of all the children of god while the other ways of life propose the more comfortable and appealing techniques and science which can attract masses of people christianity propose having the tough and not so alluring cross as a symbol which may even rebel people yes christianity is a strange because its founder is strange jesus never demanded popularity he never such proposed easy path or compromised his conviction and jesus did die in a strange way he died on the cross the cross which was a hated symbol in the perspective of ancient world crucifixion must have been the most brutal means of execution ever devised not like uh, modern methods of capital punishment that are designed to produce a quick death crucifixion was meant to ensure that the person on the cross would die a slow and agonizing death the cross was supposed to make a perfect mockery of jesus but jesus on the cross shames this notion of the world the world feels greatly arrogant in being proud the world loves to show off its ability to say that it is capable of being totally independent but jesus on the cross proves the human beings can never redeem themselves they have to come to god and they won't come on the special way jesus was so much silent uh, in on the cross and also he was silently proclaiming that you have to come to god's way and you won't or you won't come at all the cross stands all judgment over the sinful pride of the human race the cross which was the symbol of oppression and our slavery and oppression and misery now with jesus the cross symbolizes life and redemption to all people yes the cross is the symbol of shame to the world but for christians it is a symbol of salvation the cross is a symbol of absolute stupidity and absurdness to the world but for christians it is the symbol of the majestic wisdom of god st john of the cross would say the road is narrow he who wishes to travel it more easily must cast off all things and use the cross as his can in other words he must be truly resolved to suffer willingly for the love of god in all things we see in the cross in the god passion narrative two thieves on either sides died with christ on the cross the one thief mocked at jesus the other thief sought jesus the one thief looked to pride looked to himself as pride the other thief humbled totally himself in front of jesus 
so the one lost a golden opportunity the other won the prized paradise the cross with jesus hanging back and to each one of us now now we have choice like two thieves are we going to lose a golden opportunity or are we going to seek the prized paradise the choice is ours escape are you going to escape from the cross or are you going to embrace the cross are you going to exit the cross or are going to exalt the cross in many of our uh, homes and churches we have the crucifix placed at a certain height we all love to come before this crucifix express our words of devotion and endearment but perhaps the crucified savior is today calling us from the cross and telling us my child do not be far from me come closer to me learn to embrace me from close and when you come closer when you come closer then you will realize that and really the love of god and also when you look at the cross you can turn around there is back side of the cross it is completely empty there is a vacancy there is a place that could be that place to be crucified so now it is me need to think when we look at the empty place the behind the crucified crucified lord now that is the place for us for me and for you to be crucified and to crucified with our suffering lord are we ready for this are we ready to really love the lord are we ready to embrace the cross of christ and be his genuine followers when we find ourselves struggling with the hardships and trials in life when we feel the intense emptiness of god's presence in our lives we need to be like the pilgrims of the hill of crosses planting the cross of our difficulties on the inner hill of our heart and thus we will find peace uh, consolation and strength so i i could sum up and to conclude my homily with the words of our cardinal dolan i yesterday i saw his message in the tv and uh, he said a beautiful word every good friday we used to remember the passion of christ but this good friday we we are taking part in the passion of christ so we need to thank and that the op- golden opportunity that god has given to us to participate in his uh, uh, passion of christ the suffering of christ always is the stepping stone for the eternal bliss eternal peace so let us offer ourselves and ready to carry our cross on our shoulder by keeping the trust on the crucified lord as the crucified all the wounds that jesus had everything was wounded by me and by you through our sins so all the wounds that was made by the soldiers that was healed but the wounds that was made by me and you through our sins it has not been healed so let us become medicine to jesus to heal his wounds by repentance and by coming closer to crucified jesus amen
now, my friends, we stand to pray our solemn intercession. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast face, faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, May keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by, the, by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Peter, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name, and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, Graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, 
that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern us with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, Unlock prisons, loose and fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us to persevere in faith. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing. Look with compassion on our world, brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us. And in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore you. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world.
at the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my life, but only save me, my soul shall be.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord.